श्री संजीव सैन्यल प्रिंसिपल इकोनॉमिक एडवाइजर श्रीमती सुष्मिता दासगुप्ता सीनियर इकोनॉमिक एडवाइजर श्रीमती ए श्रीजा एडवाइजर श्री राजीव मिश्रा एडवाइजर श्री अरुण कुमार झा एडवाइजर श्री अरुण कुमार एडवाइजर एंड श्रीमती राजश्री राय एडवाइजर टुडेज प्रेस कॉन्फ्रेंस विल बी एज फॉलोज फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वील हैव अ फोटो ऑप विद द इकोनॉमिक सर्वे इन हैंड and then the cea will make a powerpoint presentation and uh, it will be followed by question answer session at this stage uh, i presume all of you have kept your mobile phones in the silent mode at least so uh, we'll have the photo up May I now request the CEO to uh, make his presentation. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming here to listen. to the ideas from the economic survey 2018-19 let me first start by thanking my excellent team here many of the advisors all the advisors are seated seated here and my other team who are seated uh, over there for their dedicated effort over the last several months to put this survey together i'd also like to thank several others including the consultants the directors and everybody from the uh, from the team dea for putting this survey together translators and the team from production who literally burnt the midnight oil in trying to get this in the shape that you're seeing it now also deserve our sincere gratitude last but not the least the entire team would like to thank the honorable prime minister the honorable finance minister and the honorable minister of state for providing us this opportunity to share our ideas through the economic survey so let me start let me start by first describing the theme that underlies this economic survey which is captured in the cover page of the survey the blue color the sky blue color which is uh, the color that is used for the survey captures unfettered blue sky thinking which is what we have indulged in in trying to come up with the ideas for this economic survey in an uncertain world in which we all work there are three key elements that are critical for ensuring that policies really help in reaching the common person first a vision that has already been provided by the honorable prime minister of a, a 5 trillion dollar economy by 2425 to achieve that vision a strategic blueprint is necessary that's the second element and this year's economic survey therefore makes a concerted effort to try and provide that strategic blueprint for achieving the vision laid down by the honorable prime minister third key element are tactical tools that are necessary to calibrate into this strategic blueprint so the survey especially volume 1 lays out the strategic blueprint and also talks about several of the tactical tools that are necessary to ensure that we calibrate continuously to achieving that vision so the theme of the survey is captured by this vision and that's why the central gear here is hashtag economy at 5 trillion that's the vision that i just described said by the honorable prime minister the survey talks about 
the blueprint for achieving this vision. And the key theme here is shifting gears through a virtuous cycle. As I'll just quickly describe, we have been growing at a good rate, but we now need to be shifting gears to grow at 8% continuously in a sustained manner. And that is what this strategic blueprint is about. This blueprint we intend to achieve by setting the economy on a virtuous cycle with investment as the key driver of that virtuous cycle. The tactics that we're going to be focusing on, which several chapters in the volume one of the survey describe, are behavioral economics. As I will quickly describe, this is a key departure from traditional economic thinking. We're talking about legal reforms that are required to ensure that the, uh, the ease of contracts is, is uh, enhanced. We're going to talk about data as a public good, how that can enhance the ease of living of people, and how MSMEs can be unshackled to create jobs and productivity in the economy. So that's what this cover captures with these with the theme being shifting gears, all these gears are being so shown in, a, in unison because they go together, and, and that's the theme or that is captured in the, in the cover. As before, we've actually kept the structure of uh, two volumes. The first volume lays out the strategic blueprint. It has 11 chapters in it, and with the key intent being the blueprint for achieving the hashtag economy at five trillion. The theme, as I just mentioned, is shifting gears through a virtuous cycle with investment as the key driver. The tactics are behavioral economics, nourishing MSMEs, data as public good, legal reforms, and policy consistency. Volume two is, has been, you know, in the way in which it has been presented in earlier years, with the first chapter providing the overview of the, sta of the, of the state of the economy. It will provide a ready reckoner of for the existing status and the policies that, can, that have been employed in major sectors and is supported by relevant data and, and tables. There are a couple of important additions that we've made to the presentation of the economic survey. And in this, we've been inspired by Gandhiji's talisman. Gandhiji said that think about that weakest person and how your policy can make a difference to his or her life. Therefore, we've tried to present the survey in a manner that can actually be accessed by the common person. And therefore, apart from the abstract that every chapter carries, there is also a chapter at a glance that the readers can look at to ensure that they get the gist of the chapter. There is also there are videos that have, been, uh, that have been created, short two-minute videos, to ensure that these supplement the, the abstract and the chapter at a glance. Those videos capture the key idea behind each chapter. The videos are available both in English and in Hindi to ensure that a large section of people can access the ideas behind the economic survey. So let me just quickly start by describing what we've accomplished in the last five years. As I, you know, we've, we've spoken many times, India has been a bright spot in the world economy, growing at rate that is actually higher than all the other major economies in the world. Over the last five years, the key achievements have been in creating pathways for trickle-down. We've ensured that we've grown with macroeconomic stability, which is not only have we registered high growth rates, but we've done that with low inflation and also of a fiscal deficit that has been following the glide path as laid down by the FRBM Act. We've invested in infrastructure through village electrification, through national highways, and through the Udan scheme. Cooperative federalism has really been furthered over the last five years through the, uh, through the, the, the state's share increasing to 42% and the GST Council, which is a brilliant example of this cooperative federalism. And finally, I think what is an important departure from the past, the framework for corporate exits has been created through the, uh, through the IBC, the Insolvency and the Bankruptcy Code. So these have been important structural reforms that have been uh, enacted over the last five years. Therefore, the economy is now poised for takeoff, and that is what this, the first chapter in the survey is about trying to provide that strategic blueprint for that takeoff that can happen. So 
the key departure that the survey makes is in thinking about the economy as being in either a virtuous cycle or a vicious cycle. Investment, as I just mentioned, is the key driver of that cycle. Savings that happen in the economy enable investment. Investment leads to improvements in productivity. And when firms become more productive, they're able to go and compete in the international markets, thereby foster exports, and which helps the economy. As I'm just going to show, productivity improvements also lead to job creation in the economy. And when exports and jobs come together, that creates purchasing power in the economy in, at the bottom of the pyramid, which then leads to increase in demand. Anticipating greater demand, firms go and invest further. And that is how this virtuous cycle perpetuates. So the intent really is that the economy, we are, we are intending to shift gears by taking this economy into a virtuous cycle of, uh, which is driven by investment. A favorable, favorable demographic phase, which we are currently in, supports this virtuous cycle because the proportion of working age that we're going to have in our population is really a big plus at this current stage. So this idea of viewing an economy in a virtuous cycle or a vicious cycle, we've arrived at this by carefully examining evidence from China and other East Asian economies that have registered high growth rates. In this chart, what is being shown here is the, the rate of savings, savings uh, as, as a ratio of GDP, the investment as a ratio of GDP, and the consumption as a ratio of GDP for China. Well, I'm going to show you the charts for China. The other charts for the other, other East Asian economies are available in the chapter. So what I want you to take away here is take a look at that red line, which shows consumption. Consumption as a proportion of GDP secularly declined in China as savings and investment increased significantly since the 1980s, touching up to 50% of the GDP as investment. And that is a key point that I want you to take away, which is the investment as the key driver of this, of this virtuous cycle. Another way of looking at this same thing is using development time as the, as, as, as the determin determinant. So what you find now on the x-axis is the log of GDP per capita, which captures the development time. The red line here, which is increasing, shows that as the per capita GDP increased, China's exports to GDP, that ratio, went up significantly. Also, China's savings to GDP and investment to GDP increased significantly as the economy be you know, became better and better and the per capita GDP increased. This is the virtuous cycle that we're talking about, that as the economy started doing better and better, China st started pouring more of its savings into investment, started saving even more as a proportion of its GDP and investing more. And that is what led to this virtuous cycle that we are really trying to focus on for the, uh, for, for, for the Indian economy. Some complementarities that are important to keep in mind here. So on the left side, you, what you find is how an increase in investment affects productivity, increases productivity. And that increase in productivity thereby also leads to increase in exports. On the right side, you see that an increase in the productivity leads to an increase in exports as well. So an increase in investment translates into increase in exports. Why, why are the productivity route? This is the, one of the key complementarities that the virtuous cycle really relies on. A second complementarity that is important for us to focus on is the impact of investment rates on jobs. Here what you see is an increase in the investment rate brings down the unemployment rates in, the, in, in, in various economies, and that's the other complementarity that is quite important for us to focus on. Therefore, the two key departures that we make from traditional economics are as follows. First, the economics of equilibrium. As I just showed you using the Chinese experience and what we've seen with other high growth East Asian economies as well, these high growth economies set out on a virtuous cycle. And that is what enabled them to increase the per capita GDP and thereby create welfare for their citizens. On the flip side, the global financial crisis illustrated that countries can go into a vicious cycle as well. 
as people lost their jobs, their purchasing power declined. As a result, they were able to not demand as much goods and services, which had a dampening effect on investment, and thereby the, the vicious cycle operated as well. So this is a key departure that we're making from the traditional thinking by thinking, by thinking about economies as either in a, in a vicious cycle or in a virtuous cycle. The other key departure, which, is, in which I've just uh, alluded to through some of the pictures on showing the relationship between investment and exports and investments and jobs, is that Traditional economics has viewed many of these problems of jobs, demand, investment, etc., in silos. In contrast, these are complementary phenomena that feed into each other, and that is why they should be viewed as a system, system that comprises a virtuous cycle. This virtuous cycle, as I just showed, is really affected by the demography as well. On the left side, what you see is, in the top panel, the way the increase happened in China, the proportion of the working age population, the pro proportion of population that was in the working age. And what that led to is being shown in the chart below, which, you know, which is the savings. So as people started working more, the proportion increased, savings increased in China, which is what then enabled China to invest more, and thereby the other effects that I've just spoken about. This is also being seen in other East Asian economies, the four of the economies that are being shown on the right side here, where as well the proportion of working age population increased, and thereby that led to increased savings in the economy. So the demography that we are in, and in the next two decades, we will be in a position to really avail the benefits of that demographic change that feeds into this virtuous cycle and thereby enables us to grow in a sustained manner at, 8%, um, at an 8% real growth rate. One of the other key departures that we are making, classical economics thinks about humans as robots, optimizing, Robots that always do the right thing. But all of us in our daily lives, we actually can relate that we are humans with our idiosyncrasies. A branch of economics has really worked in, you know, in this area called behavioral economics. Two years back, the Nobel Prize in economics was given to Professor Richard Taylor for his seminal work in this area, treating humans as humans and thereby you know, thinking about policies for them. I had the good fortune of learning behavioral economics from him at the University of Chicago, and therefore the second chapter in, the, uh, in, in volume one of the survey tries to create an ambitious agenda for social change but relying on some of the principles of behavioral economics. What we've done is we've tried to learn from a couple of important changes that have already happened in India over the last five years, which is the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan and the Beti Bachao Beti Badhao. So these are some, some charts that illustrate the change that happened. On your left, you see the coverage of individual household latrines, 2015-16 and 2018-19. Green shows greater coverage. I think, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. That picture clearly shows the increase in coverage from 2015-16 versus 2018-19. On your right, if you take a look, you look at the verified open defecation-free villages. Again, 2015-16 versus 2018-19, with green showing greater coverage, red showing less, less coverage. Even over here, it's palpable that the improvement has happened in ODF um, with, you know, as a result of the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. Some of us may think whether this is indeed something that can be sustained. The best way to go and look at that is the impact on health outcomes because sanitation should eventually matter for, for health outcomes. So this chart shows what happened with uh, a key health outcome, which is the diarrhea cases for children under five years. On your left, what you see is the chart for those districts where the coverage for individual household latrine was very low as of 2015. And so, as a result of the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, this coverage increased significantly in these districts. On your right are those districts where the coverage was already high, and therefore the potential for impact through the Swachh Bharat mission was less. Again, this picture is very clear that the decrease in the cases of malaria among children of age below five years has been significant in those districts where the IHHL coverage was low as of 2015. 
that shows that the impact on sanitation has indeed translated into an impact on health outcomes as well. It is not just seen in diarrhea, it's also seen in cases of malaria for children under five years, which is the, the one you know, on, on your left bottom. Cases of stillbirths, which are, these are children born uh, without life, and the children who are born underweight. All these four outcomes have translated, you know, have, have showed positive impact because of the Swachh Bharat mission. Another important campaign that really utilized behavioral economics was the Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao. Here again, we're showing a chart that shows the, uh, the, the birth ratios as of 2015-16 and 2018-19. What you find here is that the darker areas are those where the birth ratios are better. Birth ratio captures the number of girl, child, children born for every thousand boy, boy uh, children that are born. And clearly you can see here that as a result of the Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao, the improvement in the birth ratios. Using the learnings from these two campaigns, what we've tried to do is to lay out the key principles of behavioral economics. There are seven principles because of paucity of time, I'm not going to go into the details, but these principles have then been employed for thinking about transformational behavioral change in the country. I would just want to pick up one example, which is using the Gandhiji's 150th Jayanti, 150th birthday, the message of be the change that you wish to see in the world. This was the key message that Gandhiji gave to the world. And in particular, these were captured through the seven sins that Gandhiji asked us all to actually try and stay away from, which is politics without principle, wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, science without humanity, and worship without sacrifice. When we are at the stage of the 75th year of our independence, I think we are ready now to start taking, you know, taking uh, into account the fact that our duties matter a lot. As citizens, we owe it to the country to actually think about our duties, not just our rights. And these are but some examples of the way in which behavioral economics can really enable change in this country. Just to, to sort of show some of the ideas that can, that can be really worked upon, we can go from Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao to Badlao, which is basically a, 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 an anagram for Beti Aapki Dhan Lakshmi or Vijay Lakshmi. We can go from the Swaj Bharat mission to Swast and Sundar Bharat mission, a healthy India and a beautiful India. We can go from the Give It Up LPG subsidy, which really brought in for the first time thinking about giving up our subsidy for the benefit of those who deserve it more to thinking about all subsidies. When we consume a subsidy, are we depriving someone else who's more deserving of that subsidy? And here again, behavioral economics can really help in bringing about that change from going from possible tax evasion to tax compliance. And these are all steps that will really help in taking us to that vision of economy at five trillion. Another important aspect that is really critical if you have to achieve that vision of economy at five trillion, which the, the strategic blueprint talks about, is nourishing our firms, our MSMEs, to grow better. Some research that we've done you know, for the survey, I'm, I'm going to illustrate through this chart. The bars in saffron that you see here correspond to firms that have less than 99 employees. So these are small firms. The purple bars, on the other hand, correspond to those firms that have more than 99 employees. In the Indian context, we can think about them as large firms, but in the international context, these are really not large firms. A firm that employs 100 plus employees is really not that large. Typically, in the international context, you think about firms that employ a few thousand of employees as the large firms. But because of the way in which the manufacturing is in India, we're taking this cut. What I want you to take away from this slide is look at the proportion of small firms in the number of firms, the same proportion for employment, and then for the value added. What is really noteworthy here is that the small firms, these are firms with less than 99 employees, occupy 84.3% of all firms by number, which means these are the firms that dominate the landscape in organized manufacturing. 
But when you look at their relative contribution to employment and to value added, to employment, their contribution is only 23 odd percent, approximately 23 percent, despite, remember, these firms accounting for close to 85 percent by number. And their contribution to value added is only 11.6 percent. This is an important aspect that we really need to be taking into account when we think about, about you know, the, the vision of economy at five trillion, because you know, economies of scale is something that really enables firms to become more productive and thereby also create jobs. This piece of evidence also tries to actually bring to light that sometimes the perception that small firms are job creators may need a careful rethink, and that is what this data is really trying to show. So what we show in this chapter is that firms that grow over time and become large, that's what is being shown in the purple bars there, by number they account for only 16%. But they are significant contributors to employment, 77% in employment, and even more to value added, which is about 88%. That's the point that we need to take into account. The fact that economies of scale that large firms can exploit enables them to create employment and also add value. And that is something that we really need to be focusing on. So firms that actually grow up and become large, their number is low but they're contributing a lot more to employment and value added on a per capita basis. In contrast, firms that remain small, despite having aged over time, they are contributing much less to employment and to value added, even though they dominate the landscape. This is something that we really need to be focusing on. Why is this the case? We try and dig into that as well. One of the key constraints that we get here is, uh, let me also talk about how this compares with the cross-sectional evidence. What is being shown here is, on, your, on the x-axis, the, the age of the firm. And we're showing this for three countries, India, United States, and Mexico. The blue line is for India. That dotted line is for the United States, dotted uh, red line, and the dotted purple one is for Mexico. What is really noteworthy here is that a typical firm in the United States, when you compare the number of employees that it has when the firm is young, which is less than five years, and you compare the average firm that is 40 years old, the firm in the United States creates seven times as much employment as it, as it did when it was young. In India, on the other hand, these firms are only creating 40% more jobs. So a firm that is 40 years old is creating only 40% more jobs than it created when it was young. This is the crux of the problem that we are trying to identify. The fact that these firms are growing, they are basically aging, but they're not creating enough employment. Even Mexico, firms there create double the number of jobs, while in our country, it's only 40% as firms age. Why is this the case? Labor reforms are one of those. Yeah. So labor reforms pro you know, provide one of the key constraints. And in order to try and provide that evidence, what we've done is we've looked at the labor reform that Rajasthan undertook in 2014 and comparing that with some of the other states. So on your left, what you see is the, the number of factories with more than 100 employees. So these are the large firms, as I just showed, in Rajasthan, and compare that with the rest of India. Again, it is very, very clear that the number of firms, the, the cumulative growth rate of firms you know, with more than 100 employees increased significantly from 3.6% to 9.3% after the reform. But this change was not as large in the rest of India. So, the, the labor reform that Rajasthan undertook has really created you know, larger firms, firms with more than 100 employees. It's not just in the number of firms, even the number of workers and the um, number of workers, the number of workers and the total output per factory has also increased. So labor reforms have really enabled in creating more labor and capital in the state. So this is one key uh, aspect that we must be focusing on. The chapter goes on to think about some of the policy nudges that, that, should be, that we should be focusing on. First, we have to, be fo we have to really uh, double down on incentivizing infant firms rather than small firms. The idea is very simple. All of us have, I'm sure, seen when we had uh, you know, our kids learning a bicycle. 
We provided that kid a support, support wheel so that the kid did not fall. But suppose we told the child that you can always drive the cycle with those support wheels, the child would never learn to drive a bicycle on her own. So good parenting is about really taking those support wheels out and telling them, initially keeping them when the child is re learning to bicycle, but then take them out so that the child is able to bicycle on, you know, on her own independently. That is the way in which we have to actually let the MSMEs unshackle them and grow them, you know, uh, by, by enable them to grow and create jobs and productivity in the economy. So this can be done by having a sunset clause for all the, uh, the size-based incentives that we have with the necessary grandfathering so that the firms get the time and the opportunity to sort of shape up to be able to, uh, you know, uh, to be adapt into this, to this change. Focus on infant firms in the more employment intensive sectors like construction, uh, like, like uh, uh, tourism, etc., and focus on service sectors with high, sp uh, high spillovers. Tourism is, is, is one, one good example. A few more, few more ideas, which is one, one of the key things that we are now witnessing is data. The power of data, which has is, which is really become uh, important in the, in the current scenario. So one of the chapters that we have in, this, in the volume one is data of the people, by the people, for the people. Thinking about data as a public good. Just imagine, just let me paint out two scenarios to you. On your left, think about someone a lady who is in, in a remote village who can access on her smartphone the nearby hospitals. Not only the hospital, but she can also access what is the quality rating of this hospital. Now imagine if someone in that village becomes sick and has to be rushed in an emergency. This piece of information can really be life-saving to that particular that, that woman and people in, that, in the village itself. On the right, think about an application, an app, where a farmer who possibly ha you know, wants a loan uses that app to request the amount of the loan, specifies the term for that loan, how long, what should be the maturity, and also gives his permission to the bank to utilize the data to, to screen and decide on whether the loan should be given or not. All this is done through the app. The farmer does not need to, to run from pillar to post at all. The banks use FinTech to basically screen the loan and once, they are, once a loan is approved, the bank just credits the lo loan amount directly into the bank account of the, of, of the farmer. This can all happen without the farmer ever having to step out of his home just using his phone. And that is, what, that is the potential that data as a public good really provides. This is because the marginal cost of data has really gone down, while the marginal benefits have gone up significantly. And that's why data can be visualized as a public good. Governments today need to be investing, therefore, in creating data as a public good in exactly the same way as governments create roads, ports, et cetera, as, as public goods, same way governments need to be investing in data as a public good to enhance the welfare of people. A final you know, uh, chapter that I'm going to focus on is something that is really important for achieving that vision of, 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 five, of the five trillion economy, which is about the legal infrastructure. An important fact that we all must take note of is that among 190 odd countries in the, in the World Bank rankings on ease of doing business, India ranks 163rd or in the bottom 15% when we talk about the ease of, ease of contractual enforcement. And this is because we have a backlog of three and a half crore cases in our, in our courts, 90% of which is in the lower courts, the district and subordinate courts. So this chapter, looks at this particular problem, and the key point this chapter makes is that this problem is not as, as insurmountable, I repeat, not as insurmountable as it seems. And we've just done some simple analysis to show that a 100% clearance rate in the district and subordinate courts can be achieved by recruiting about 2,200 odd judges, which is well within sanction capacity. The backlog of, of these cases can be cleared within five years through a 25% improvement in productivity. And this productivity improvement can be brought by using technology, by enabling the administrative backbone of these courts, and also possibly by working on the, on, on the vacation time. In a similar manner, the analysis shows that for high courts, 
A 100% clearance rate can be achieved by recruiting 90 odd additional judges, which is also within sanction capacity. And the backlog can be cleared within five years by a 4% increase in productivity at the sanction strength. For the Supreme Court, the backlog can, backlog can be cleared through an 18% improvement in the productivity. So this chapter makes a clear message that both by recruiting or by, by, by having judges within sanction capacity and by bringing about improvements in productivity, by you know, bringing in technology, by enabling the administrative backbone, the ease of contractual enforcement can really be enhanced. And this would be the best investment that India can make in trying to go towards the $5 trillion economy. So in sum, as I just said, the economic survey lays out a strategic blueprint for achieving that vision of economy at $5 trillion. The key theme is about shifting gears. We've grown well, but we need to shift gears. We need to shift into top gear at 8% plus sustained growth. And we can do that by pursuing a virtuous cycle with investment as the key driver. In coming up with this model for, for development in India, the survey makes a significant departure, and which I just described. Another key departure is thinking about you know, about uh, humans as humans when we think about policy for them, and that's where behavioral economics really helps in creating policies. Unshackling MSMEs to grow and thereby create jobs and exports for the economy, creating data as a public good to enhance the ease of living of people, and clearing the legal logjam, which can possibly be the best investment for achieving that vision of economy at five trillion. I thank you very much for your patience.